Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I am Matt Cedarberg from T-Spines, Inc., and I'm joined today by Florin Ezvoranu from Evolute GmbH. Today we'll be showing how to use T-Spines for Rhino and Evolute tools for Rhino together to create and panel freeform architecture shapes. Now this is a webinar that I've been hoping to put on ever since I met the team from Evolute last year and learned that they were planning to write a Rhino plugin. Their software really fills a need in freeform architecture and is an ideal complement for T-Spines. So um, to set the table before I introduce Evolute, let me first introduce our company, T-Spines Inc. So T-Spines Inc. makes products that simplify organic CAD modeling in Rhino and SolidWorks, making it easier, faster, and more fun. T-Spines helps designers, engineers, and architects to spend less time surfacing, create smooth, high-quality CAD models, and achieve the right look and feel. And an important feature for us is that T-Spines models can be manufactured with traditional manufacturing methods and also pass downstream to other CAD software so that it can fit seamlessly into your design pipeline. So this means that if you design a ring with T-Spines, it can be milled or cast just like any other ring that you would design in Rhino. If you design a sculpted, swoopy form with T-Spines, like the company Grain does, you can see and see it using traditional machinery. This toy car design in T-Spines is now available to purchase at your local toy store, and it was manufactured just like any other toy car. So when it comes to freeform architecture design with T-Spines, our message always was, well, just build it like you would any other freeform architecture. Um, the problem with that answer is that building freeform architecture is not trivial. Besides the structural integrity, just achieving the aesthetic forms that the architect intended can be tricky. And that's where Evolute Tools comes in. The Evolute team are the experts in taking 3D architectural models, analyzing them, and breaking them down into panels so they can be constructed to meet aesthetic and functional criteria. And let me turn uh, the mic over to Florin at Evolute to explain a little bit more about their company and, uh, and, and how they do what they do. Hey, everyone. This is Florin from uh, Evolute. As the slide says, the company has been founded in 2008 as a spin-off uh, from the research group from Geometric Modeling and Industrial Geometry at the Vienna University of Technology. Uh, we have been working with some uh, really cool projects along the years, uh, mainly from architects like Zaha Hadid, uh, Mario Bellini Architects, uh, Wagner Bureau, Asymptote Architecture, RFR, Sealy, Formtex, and Alma. And yeah, well, our services are related to uh, geometric consultancy related to architectural surfaces. So we can do 3D model analysis for cost estimation and feasibility studies. Uh, we can improve or do the layout of panelization seams according to various aesthetic and functional criteria. And this can be applied to either freeform or non-freeform surfaces. We can optimize panel geometry with respect to economical, productional, environmental, and other subjective constraints. Objective constraints. Uh, we can optimize the, the geometric layout of the substructure, and we can also generate uh, production data from from the three D models. Uh, that can include panel man management, track and trace, and another important uh, important product product of our company is the Evolute Tools for Rhino, which is a Rhino plugin that architects and designers can use at the early stages of, uh, of design to just to improve, panelize, and panelize freeform architectural surfaces. And of course, we can do some specialized software if, uh, if it's necessary on some special applications. And uh, we will show you some of the projects we have been working on. You probably are familiar with the Yas Island Marina Hotel. And here we have been doing the panelization and optimized uh, the steel structure, the grid shell of this uh, canopy. So we actually used our um, Rhino plugin for this. And 
we have been optimizing this grid shell structure to be nice and smooth and to have the connectivity desired. Yeah, we can go further. And just just a, a, a note about this, the actual optimization was for the substructure, for the, the steel uh, structure of this, of this canopy and not the actual uh, glass panels that you see, but that's, uh, that's just a consequence of course. Yeah, we can go further. And the Museum of Islamic Arts at the Louvre. And the task here was to produce this uh, flying carpet-like shape from uh, flat panels of glass. And because the shape was, um, had a lot of curvature in it, we had to create this hybrid mesh consisting of triangles and quads in order to get the quads uh, planner. Okay, we can go further. Here are some uh, renderings. Uh, and we have the Eindhoven blob. The task here was to actually align some of these seams along the floor slabs and to, imp and to improve the panelization with, this, with respect to density and layout. And today we will show you how to use our uh, Rhino plugin to optimize and penalize uh, and, and planarize some, uh, some freeform surfaces. This is a very easy to use tool and it's, it's really powerful especially in combination with other software like T-splines for example. Uh, as I said before it's important that this tool can be used at the early stages of design so you can uh, improve the design way up to the tender phase so you have a better idea of the cost and what what will be necessary to produce your your freeform surface okay um, before I turn the time over to Florin to actually show Evolute tools we just had a couple of polls that we wanted to ask just to get a better understanding of who's at the webinar today um, one question that we were just curious about is um, how many freeform architecture models uh, have you made in the uh, in the past couple of years? So if you can just click in the answer if you've made if you haven't made any, if you're just kind of watching this to see what there is, uh, one or two, three or ten, or over ten. Um, just kind of curious to see get a better idea of the trends from what you're seeing in your in your part of the world as far as how popular three uh, freeform archit architecture is today. So we'll just leave this open a couple more seconds. If you could uh, kind of click the respective answer. And we'll go ahead and close this up. Um, so let's go ahead and share these results with you. Uh, you can see uh, that actually a decent number of you have made over 10 uh, freeform architectural models in the past couple of years. Um, and then you can kind of see how it breaks down beneath that. It's very interesting for us to for us to see. Thanks for thanks for sharing part of that poll. Um, one other poll we just wanted to 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 launch before we jump into the Evolute tools uh, demo is how many of you have actually had a chance to use Evolute tools for I know? Uh, if you can just click yes or no if you've had a chance to use either if you, if you have a full license or uh, a trial license, this will help. Florin kind of talk to the right level as he's introducing the software. So let's we'll leave this uh, open a couple more seconds again. Go ahead and uh, close it now. Um, okay, so you can see that about two thirds of you, or about a third of you, have used Evolute tools, and then this is new to two thirds of you. So, um, so that's great. We're we're glad to introduce this to you today. And um, one uh, just one other bit of information I wanted to share before uh, I turn the time over to to Florin again to, with this demo. The impetus for this webinar is actually the the T Spines Design Contest that's going on right now. 
Evolute is one of the sponsors of the contest. Um, we have over 100 prizes worth over $15,000. And um, if you go to, and register for the contest today at tspines.com slash contest, we've made arrangements with a number of Rhino plugins, including Evolute, V-Ray, Orca 3D, T-Splines. And um, you'll be able to get a special free trial to use throughout the duration of the contest. Um, none of these companies usually have a free trial that lasts that long. But if you're just here today for the contest at tsplines.com slash contest, um, you can get a free trial of both Evolute and tsplines that will last until August 9th. Um, so with that, let me, let me turn the screen over to, to Florin and let him uh, show how, how tsplines and Evolute work together. Let's see. Are you? Uh, I think you may be muted right now, Floren. Yes. Sorry about that. I'm back. Okay. There you go. I will go. just walk you through the, the workflow of Evolute Tools for Rhino. And uh, our plugin involves taking an input surface, which can be a uh, NURB surface or a mesh or a T-spline surface, and we will call this a reference surface. This is basically the shape where you want to get it. Uh, this is your dream shape, this is the shape of your project. And the next step involves building up a coarse mesh with mesh primitives and by using the subdivision tools we will just subdivide this coarse mesh into getting the desired connectivity and the desired density. And by using the optimization process we will force this subdivided mesh to take the shape of the input surface. So we are actually here today, as Matt said, because of freeform architecture and we need, we need better tools today in order to be able to build uh, freeform architecture. And one of those tools, of course, is, relates to panelize and optimize and planarize these freeform surfaces. Um, the, the webinar will actually focus on why is really important to have tools like T-Splines and Evoluted Tools working together because of course T-Splines offer a lot of flexibility in modeling freeform surfaces. You don't have the limitations of the NURB surfaces and you can just you can go while creating whatever you like. And of course the power of Evoluted Tools will allow you to uh, penalize and optimize those freeform surfaces from the early stages of design. So let's just start by, by creating a simple uh, T-splines object. My intention for today is to create something like an architectural tower. And I will just use a box for the beginning, a T-splines box. Let me just break in, Florin. I forgot to, to mention this before I turn the time over to you, but if you have okay. questions during the webinar, just go ahead and type them in on the, the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, we have some staff that can type back answers during the webinar, and then also we'll, we'll be able to take those audibly at the end as well. So feel free to, to type in if you have any questions at all. Okay, so we started with a simple box. Uh, if you're familiar with T-splines, we can now go to box mode. Uh, we can just click this button or hit the toggle. Okay, uh, it's just easier to do all the rough modeling in box mode. Now I want to get a bit more height into this object of mine. Uh, we, could just, we could have just started with a taller object and do some subdivision on it, but I'll just, this is a chance to show you some extrusion tools. So I'll put my manipulator on and I will select some faces and I will extrude them to get a bit more height into this object. Okay, that's about it. I'm happy with it. Let's just go to smooth mode to see how this tower looks like. And I want my tower to have a blunt edge near the top and as well as the bottom because this is kind of hard to build. So I will select those top faces and bottom faces and just delete them. This is better. 
I will go to box mode again. I'll just toggle and I want to get a, some twist into this tower just to make things a bit more interesting. So I will select all the vertices and do some universal transformation and get some twist. I'll do a 90 degree twist. Okay, next I want to copy this tower into a polar array. So I'll create a center for myself here, about here, and I'll do a polar array. Just one comment on how uh, Florin did the, the twist. You'll notice that you can use those powerful Rhino UDT commands with T-splines, but most of them you'll want to actually make sure you do it on the T-splines control points instead of the actual model. So, uh, so that way it will stay as a T-spline. Yeah, just forgot to mention that. Okay, let's have a look at this uh, T-splines toggle. And I, this will be my architectural tower, but I will want to bridge these towers together in some places. I will go to box mode again. And I will just bridge some faces. You just have to be careful at your seams, starting points. Good. I'm going to do a few more bridges. And another one. Sorry. Wrong seams. Okay, so this is my target for today. We can go to smooth mode and see how this uh, architectural object looks like. Now, I want you to note that this actually took me, I don't know, less than five minutes maybe. And you can try this with nerves, but I'm sure it will take a longer while. So it's, this is a really nice combination that the power T-splines, creating freeform ob objects, it's just child's play. Okay, now the next step will be to, as I have shown you before, we have made our architectural object, it's ready, and we'll, we will use it as a reference surface. And now we have to start to create this coarse mesh. So let's just do that. And the beauty about working with T-splines and Evoluted tools together is that T-splines actually really simplify the creation of that coarse mesh, mesh which normally you will do by using 3D primitives. And it's a, sometimes it can be a laborious manual uh, process. So I will just copy this T-splines object. I have the toggles on. Uh, let's just disable this. Sorry, guys. Uh, can't find the option. Let's see, what are you looking for? Uh, just uh, trying to. Oh, do the smooth toggle. Uh, Disable, yeah, the, the, the toggles, the, the hotkeys. Oh, just click on the, it says hotkeys enabled on your heads-up display. It's, it's kind of just to the right of your mouse, where it is right now. Oh, it's on the previous, yeah, just click the blue text, and it will, and it will oh, make it disabled. Yeah. There you go. Of course. Thanks. Okay, so I copied my uh, T-splines object, and it's in smooth mode. As you can see, I will go to box mode again. And I will create my coarse mesh from this control polygon, actually. Uh, I will just convert it to a Rhino object. And as you can see, this is actually just a simple mesh. And this is ready to be used for the subdivision process. 
and this will become our course mesh. First, that uh, there's a thing that you need to check first when you convert this T-splines object to to a mesh. You have to weld some vertices. So just go to weld. I'll set a relative a generous tolerance there, and I'm pretty sure that all the vertices there are welded now. I'll just copy this to a uh, different layer. Okay. So at this point, I can start to subdivide this object into getting the correct density and connectivity here. Uh, these bridges need to get a bit more density there. I'll just do some loop cuts here. I'll, I'll subdivide this other bridges too. For while you're doing that subdividing. Now, let me know if, I, if I'm going to, to uh, too fast with it. Yeah, no, this is great. But what, yeah, I'll just cut in while you're subdividing. There's a question about whether T-spines can be exported with the same file extensions as a Rhino NURBS. And the answer to that is yes, you can convert T-spines exactly to NURBS and Florin will do that a bit later. Now, but you can also convert it to a boxy mesh, which is what Florin did to, to get this shape. So in the case of Working with Evolute, both of those are actually really useful to give you the starting geometry for the panels and also the reference surface for, for the matchup as well. Exactly. I mean, if you if you started to create this object with NURBS, now you'll have to do the coarse mesh manually. And that means basically building up faces and faces and faces and faces here. So we have our coarse mesh. Let's just go to this slide here. And we can do some more subdivision to get more density. Okay. And I will use some of our tools. I will do some Ketmul Clark subdivision first. Let me move this so you can see better what it does. Okay. And I will do some Ketmul Clark on this one again. The good thing is that you can subdivide in steps and keep the parents so we can modify the parents if you if you're not happy with the connectivity of uh, of a specific sub subdivided mesh and now just to make things a bit more interesting I will subdivide this with a diagonalize algorithm so we have this diagonalized pattern on our object as I said, subdividing creates a child object and we can identify all these dependencies if we need to. And of course, if we want to start to subdivide again another, another child, we can just decouple it. It's not dependent on its parent anymore and we can start a new subdivision branch from it. But we don't need that right now. I will just delete all these parents and this is our subdivided mesh and we now can start to begin the optimization process uh, in order to get for example all these quad faces planner in case we want to build this out of glass first we need to set our t-splines object as a reference and I will convert it to a Rhino object before as you can see it, it maintains the exact shape of the T-splines object and we can set it as a reference. This will take a while. Um, here up top we have the uh, Evolute Tools toolbar and of course down here we have the T-splines toolbar. Florin, when you're when you're running those Evolute commands, you may want to to hover just a little bit over the icon so they can see the name um, if it's unfamiliar to them. Yeah, thanks for the tip. Uh, can you still see, see my screen? Um, I can see. I I don't see anything that's updated recently. I don't know. Um... Yeah, it's um, setting as a reference. Just takes a while. Okay. Now, just a few words about the optimization process. We can optimize for different things like planarity or the fairness of the seams. And this is really important when you actually start to build something. And especially important if you want to build your object out of, uh, with a glass facade, for example, 
where flat planar quads are really, really important. Otherwise, you'll have to use uh, single curved or double curved glass, which is really expensive. So you really want to optimize for, for planarity. Okay, we set our uh, uh, converted T-splines as a reference now, and we can start the optimization process. I will just move this subdivided mesh closer to our reference. And we can first check out the optimization parameters. So we see which are the most important parameters. For starts, we have surface closeness and curve closeness. We have some other parameters here. Uh, I will just go to the default settings first. Go to default, and we have surface closeness and curve closeness. That means that the optimization process will uh, try to make this object become really close to our reference and have the borders really close to our reference object. Okay, so let's just start to optimize. I will select my mesh and hit the ET optimize button. And the first time you do an optimization step, it will take a while, but then it's much faster. Okay, now we're closer to our reference object. I'll just hide the reference for now. And since we optimized only for surface closeness, we can actually see how close we are to our reference object by analyzing the closeness. And we have a color-coded version, and we can set the range. And this is pretty much really, really close. These are model units, I'm working in meters, so we are actually down to one millimeter. And right now we'll start to optimize for some other parameters like planarity, for example. Let's take a look at the planarity first. And let's set the range. And if you want to build this out of glass right now, you will have to use a lot of curved panels. Actually, probably only curved panels, and that will drive the cost just sky high. And these this value here um, represents the shorter distance, shortest distance between the diagonals of a quad face. So we have 1.4 meters, which is a lot. It's a lot of curvature. So let's just start to see if we can improve that. First, I will ramp up the planarity term. Let's just go to 1. And we will optimize and see how the result looks like. Let's just do a couple more steps. OK. Let's set the range. And it's not going really well, so we will have to uh, ramp up some other parameters to get a lot more fairness into this uh, subdivided mesh. So let's just go to fairness curvature and put something like 0.5 and optimize again. Let's just do a few more steps. This is a gradual process. And you can just stop. You can stop if you reach a desired result. Let's just set the range, and now we are down to uh, 33 centimeters in difference. This is the distance between the diagonals of a quad face. So it's uh, it's improving, but not a lot. We still have to use a lot of uh, curved glass here, which is still really expensive. So. If we want to take a look at uh, the glass panels that are actually f flatter, let's just go to point 0.1, and we don't have a lot of flat glass here. So let's, let's just optimize further. I will ramp up the planarity term. Let's just go to 5. OK, optimize. and set the range again. Um, the the planarization algorithm 
is a pretty powerful one, so it will sometimes deform the mesh trying to get those planar quads. In case that happens, we have to ramp up some other parameters. Let's just try to get a bit more fairness and maybe lower it just a bit and optimize again. So basically, Florin, as you're, as you're playing around with these different parameters, in a way it's kind of like a, a rank order of which one's most important, is that right? Or what do the different values mean? Exactly, it's, it's like a priority list. And there are some funky things happening over here if we want to relax the mesh where it starts to bulge up, we just have to ramp up furnace springs. This is like um, putting tension in all the mesh edges. Let's optimize again. And you can see there are some pretty big changes there. Yeah, we still have some issues around the bridges, but we will we will get rid of those by playing with some other parameters. Let's set the range again, and we're down to 32 centimeters again. Let me see if I can improve this further. I'll just increase the tension a bit. And optimize. And you can see it, it relaxes those those uh, problem areas there. Now I can ramp up planarity just to get get these quads more uh, more flat or flatter. Let's just go to uh, five and optimize again. Now, an interesting thing to note about uh, the planarization process is that there is always a trade-off in, in freeform surfaces because you, you can't get a freeform surface planarized and really close to your uh, original reference surface. So if we look at the closeness right now, you can see that we moved quite a lot. So you just can't have everything. Now I will let's just try something else instead of ramping up uh, planarity more. I will subdivide this mesh further in order to get a uh, hybrid mesh. So I'll just start to add diagonals uh, to some of these faces with an interval. So as you're so adding, have a, yeah, yes, yeah, you're adding those four. And here's just one question about the optimizations, it looks like you'd never really need to undo those because you have the reference polysurface, so you're never really undoing, you're just changing how you are optimizing, is that right? Yeah, you're just wrapping, ramping up and ramping down parameters, and it's, it's a gradual and step-by-step -step process. You can, of course, undo if you're unhappy with the, with the result, but um, it's, it's almost, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can just tweak the parameters in order to get the result you want. You don't have to undo necessarily. You, you can undo if you get an unpredictable result, let's say. Gotcha. Now, let's get back to our hybrid mesh. So, as you can see, this consists now in, in uh, planar, in, sorry, in just quads and triangles. And because of the triangles are actually flat, the optimization process will have a lot more freedom in moving the vertices of these quads in order to get them planar. So let's just let's just start to optimize further and see if we can improve this result. Let's just set the range again for for planarity to see where we are now, and we're down to 28 centimeters. So let's optimize. 
So as you can see, as soon as we have a lot more freedom to, to work with, for example, some triangles, the optimization is way better. Let's set the range again, and we're down to, down to 14 centimeters. Now from this on, we can just ramp up planarity. Let's just go to 8. and optimize again. Yeah, you can do as many steps as you want or you can actually set the, um, the number of iterations for the optimization steps. So this is one for now. Okay, let's set the range again and this is a much better result. We're now down to six centimeters. So this is what the optimizer does. Now another interesting thing to note is that when the optimizer tries to get these quads planar, it has to loop, it has to move a lot of the vertices around them. So around the bridges here, we have some uh, undesired uh, curvature in these uh, seams, and if those seams were supposed to be aligned with floor levels then we have a problem, but we can actually um, optimize for that. So we will select the seams that we want to get aligned with the floor levels. I will just select the desired vertices. Let's just get this one, okay, and I will set it to become coplanar. And I will set it to become coplanar with a parallel plane, as a parallel plane to the base plane. Okay. Now, in order to optimize for coplanarity, we just have to ramp up the coplanarity term. Let's just go to 2 and optimize. Now, this looks much better. We have all these seams nicely aligned with the floor level. And we can do the same thing for the others. Let's just select a few more. This one and the other bridges. That's selected. Okay, next one. This bridge. Set to become coplanar. And the lower one. And I think we have to select the top ones too. I haven't been there. Okay, just another one. And let's optimize. Nice. And of course we can do with all the seams in the rest of the towers. For example, if we, if we want to have this aligned with the floor slabs, we just select the row of vertices. And set it to become coplanar. Optimize again. and it has become coplanar. So this is a nice way to optimize for aligning your, your facade to your uh, floor slabs, which is especially useful if you have structural supports and so on. We can select some other sets of vertices. For example, we have some deformation here at the bridges. Let's just try to get this nice and straight. Now let's optimize. Great. And because moving all those vertices represents a trade-off in planarity to probably some of the 
uh, neighboring quad panels. Let's see if, if we changed the polarity. So it's actually it's not a lot. It's just a tiny movement there. And we have all those seams aligned with the floor levels. So this is what, uh, what Evoluta tools can do for panelizing and optimizing panelizing freeform surfaces. Um, an interesting thing to note is, of course, as you have seen, the optimization has a list of parameters, which is like a priority list. So if you want to have the quads planner, you'll just have to ramp up planarity or actually downgrade um, surface closeness, let's say, and so on and so forth. That's excellent, so Florent. Let me know if you have any questions about the optimization process. Yeah. Yeah, we've got actually a number of questions coming in. <clears throat> um, is now a good time for those, or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, and uh, and just one note as you as you leave the webinar at some point when you when you click out of it, we have a survey that will pop up. If you could just respond to that and give us some feedback as far as uh, what was useful and what suggestions you have for us, that helps us improve future webinars as well. So one question, Florin, is, is the evaluation of Evolute restricted in the number of faces in a mesh? The trial version that we have on our website is limited to manipulating meshes with no more than 256 faces. Um, what about the version that you're making available for the T-Splines contest? Ah, the nice thing is that the people that have registered in the contest can use a fully functional version of Evoluta Tools for Rhino, which is really nice because maybe you can't do a lot with 256 faces. You just you can play around with it and you can see what it does, but uh, if you have registered in the contest, you can use a fully functional version of our plugin for the duration of the contest. Yeah, and I, that's yeah. We're really excited about that. So just as a as a reminder, um, you'll want to send it for the T spines contest, and that way you can get that fully functional, extended trial of Evolute software. So um, let me uh, and and just one other word before we before we switch back to Florin. One other thing about our T spines contest, the the architecture category specifically, one of our other sponsors, Z Corp has agreed to make 3D prints of the top 10 entries a number of times during the contest and ship them to you so you can get real life feedback. Um, the contest ends on August 9th, but that first deadline to, to qualify for those free models during the contest is on July 5th. So there, again, there's details at tsplines.com slash contest, but if you do want to enter the architecture category and take advantage of those free models, um, you'll want to start submitting soon. Um, let me change the presenter back to, back to Florin and get back to some of these technical questions. So, uh, there's, there's quite a few of them. Um, can you explain uh, the original closeness option a little bit more precisely? Does that still make sense in this context, Florian? Uh, say again, the closeness? Yeah, there's, is there a closeness option like the original closeness? Yeah, let me just check that. Uh, we have an original closeness, yes. Um, is there a way that you could the options? Yeah. Is there a way you could explain that um, a little bit more precisely? Well, let's say that you you have a reference surface, right, which has a certain uh, area, but you have a smaller mesh that you want to optimize as a patch on that area. So, in case you want to optimize just that a smaller mesh but to the surface of the area, just project it on the surface of your reference, uh, then you, you will have to have your original closeness to, uh, to one. Is, is, it, uh, is it clear? Um, it's, it, it works for me. Um, what, one other comment I'll have is, is there's a lot more of these technical questions. We'll have Florin answer as many of them as, as we have time for, but um, Evolute also has a form on their website, and we'll include a link to that in the follow-up email. But um, I'd imagine that you would, your team would be very interested in answering any questions posted on your form as well. Is that right, Florin? Absolutely, absolutely. Great. Um, could you also uh, 
be a little bit more precise about what, what uh, curve closeness means? Curve closeness is a parameter just that tells the optimization algorithm to snap the, the boundaries of your subdivided mesh to the boundaries of your reference surface. So for example, here at the top we will need uh, curve closeness just to snap those rows of vertices here from the subdivided mesh to the edges of your reference surface. Great. Um, is it possible to set a tolerance for the gap between the panels? Not in the Rhino plugin that we have right now. Uh, that option might be there in the future. We have that option in our in-house software. Um, I haven't probably mentioned this, but uh, Evolute Tools for Rhino is is just a branch, um, commercial branch from our in-house software. So we can do that, we can do that in the consulting services and maybe that option will be in the commercial uh, plugin at some point, but we, we can't know for sure at this point. Great. Um, is it possible to take the singularities out of the optimization process? Uh, that's an interesting question. Well, you can do some manual editing here, for example, but uh, you will still get some singularities. I mean, uh, it's, it also depends on the shape of your object. Um, because if you have something like this, for example, this tower with bridges, you will need more families of curves in order to cover this whole surface. So, um, if you have if you have something like some some really simple shape that is kind of four uh, edged, uh, it has four boundaries. Then you of course you can take out uh, the singularities. But you have a more complex object that just branches out. You will probably have some singularities somewhere somewhere. Another interesting thing that is that we can subdivide our objects in order to get a hexagonal mesh, for example, and of course you, you don't have any uh, significant singularities there because they are basically all singularities, but yeah, it depends on the shape of your object a lot. Okay. Um, Florian, can both meshes and NURBS be used as reference surfaces for panelization or is it restricted just to NURBS? No, you can use meshes. You can use even T-spline surfaces, uh, everything. It doesn't have to be a nerve surface. If, if you use a mesh, of course, you, you have to have it a bit denser, so um, the optimization process will have some freedom to move the vertices onto, onto that reference. Yep, yeah, no, that's, that's a powerful feature. Um, so here's a question, um, is the problem of optimizing for multi is, um, I guess I'm not sure exactly what this means, but are you using an evolutionary algorithm behind Evolute? Does that make any, does that make sense in this context for him? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to answer that question. This is probably something we can answer on our forum. I think our developers will be able to answer that, that's for sure. Great. I can uh, just take a wild guess, but... Uh, hey, no, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, so... Um, which geometrical principles are used for the planarization? Is it the reduction of the distances between the quad diagonals? Um, I think this is another question for our forum. I think it has multiple, uh, let's say, uh, starting points, other the reduction of, of the gaps of the diagonals or some just other forms of uh, optimization. But yeah, this is something that Alex uh, or Michael can answer. Um, really precisely. Great. Um, Someone's just curious what kind of hardware uh, you've got running right now, like what your processor or RAM or graphics card is? Or maybe what even kind of what you'd recommend or is necessary for, to run Evolute? Let me see if I can show it to you. Can you see this? Um, I think he was, you're just showing your Rhino. Um, window right now, so you could probably okay. click show my screen to show the whole screen. There you go. 
this is just one of the workstations we use here, but uh, I use the plugin on, on the other laptop, which is not as good, and it, ha it doesn't have any problem. Uh, you know, you don't need to have a lot of uh, processing power for this stuff. Okay. I mean, if, if you if you can run Rhino on your on your machine, that's just it's enough. It's sufficient. Great. The the, the laptop I use our plugin and T-splines onto doesn't even have a dedicated uh, graphics card. Okay. Um, any idea about how far away in your example your end result was from the original shape? Um, how far away are we right now? Uh huh. Okay, so in closeness, we went to one meters in difference from the original surface, from the original startup. And in planarity, uh, it's planarity was a lot. I think the original planarity difference was something like one point some one point four meters. And now we're down to six centimeters, is as uh, the shortest distance between the diagonals of uh, quad face. Great, yeah. And you just kind of raced through this just in the webinar. I'm just curious, like in general, like in a in a production setting, how how long would this process be as far as kind of toggling between the different uh, optimization settings? Well, this is just real time. I mean, as long as you get a bit familiar with the interface and you know, read the documentation and see what the parameters do, uh, I don't think it, it lasts longer than uh, what I've did right now. Yeah. And maybe it's hard, hard to maybe it's hard to believe, but actually this is as simple as this and as fast as this. And this is something I wouldn't want my clients to know. Because if they know that I'm doing something really easy and it's really easy to work with, they'll say, eh, maybe he doesn't deserve all that money. This is really easy. <laughs> um, okay, so here, here's another question. If the, if the slab edges were to be moved vertically to align with the floor plans, would there be a way to optimize the mesh to create more panels of a similar size again? Um, let me see if I got this uh, right way. And the question is if we optimized this uh, row of uh, vertices to become vertical, then can, can you just repeat the question? Um, yeah, I'll read it again and then Jonathan, if you have, if you want to clarify this at all, if the slab edges were to be moved vertically to align with floor plans, would there be a way to optimize the mesh to create more panels of similar size again? Uh -huh, I think I understand. I mean, if you move them vertically, um, let's just try to do something. Um, probably we can't. Yeah, you, we need to move instead of vertices somewhere. Let's just find a leg somewhere. Okay. And Let's just select this row of uh, vertices, and for some reason, let's say we want them to be, oh, not this one, sorry, let's just, let me select again. I'll move them a bit, and let's, let's say we want them to be fixed there for some reason, maybe you have some structural supports, okay? So all those vertices are now fixed, and we are optimizing, and as you can see, the optimization algorithms spaced all these uh, panels again in order to get them in a you know similar sized. Does that clarify? That looks good to me. We, can, Jonathan, if you have any more questions, you can go ahead and type in. Um, Oh, looks looks great. Looks like you answered that great. Um, let's see, just a couple more questions. We got about five more minutes. Hopefully, we can get through all these. Um, can the T spine model be nested? Um, that may be more of a question for our team. I, on, and I, I don't know if we know what that what that context nested. is. 
probably something like a uh, block or a reference. Like a block or a reference. I'm looking at my developer in the room. Um, we'll we'll look into that, and we'll get we'll get back with you. We don't. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll look into that. Um, let's see. Can you have hexagonal meshes in Rhino with Evolute tools? Yes. Um, if you ask that question, you probably know that Rhino doesn't fully support, uh, you know, poly meshes. But uh, for our purposes, with Evolute tools, we can have hexagons and pentagons, and we can have them all mixed in a mesh. It can be any kind of hybrid mesh. You can have triangles in it. You can have hexagons. You can have uh, quads. You can have a lot of mix there. Great, but as far as actually displaying those hexagons, maybe uh, maybe not today in Rhino. Is that right? You can display the hexagons in shade mode, render mode, but you cannot export that poly mesh. So the displaying works well. Okay, great. Um, actually, just let me load one quick example so you can see this. It's a, it's a good example. I'll just save this in case we need to get back to it. And let me load a, a hexagon example. Okay, I think this answers your question pretty clearly. Yeah, that's great. That looks great. Um, <clears throat> okay, a few more questions. Can you use do loop subdivisions instead of Camel Clark's? Um, can you repeat that, please, Matt? Yeah, can you use do Sabin loop subdivisions instead of Camel Clark's? Yeah, you can do a series of, of loop cuts instead of uh, doing Catmull Clark. Um, the difference is if you want to subdivide, let's say, uh, some kind of mesh with loop cuts instead of doing Catmull Clark, is that the loop cuts will not try to smoothen the mesh. But uh, the Catmull Clark algorithm will try to smoothen the mesh. So let's say that if you have some kind of uh, pronounced corner somewhere, with Catmull Clark it will be really smooth. But if you do loop cuts, uh, the corner will remain there. Okay, great. If you adjust the reference object, does the optimized model change as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, right now I have a uh, poly surface, so... Which is kind of hard to adjust, isn't it? Let's uh, see if I can do something with it. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll have to. Uh, let's scale this. Okay, so we scale the reference. Let's try to optimize. Probably the result will not be very good for starts, but yeah, the optimization process will uh, take note of any changes to your reference and you know, realign everything. Great. Um, let's see, is there a version for Rhino 564-bit? Not yet. There will be in the future, just can't know for sure when. As okay. you can see, we just uh, scaled our reference and the optimization algorithm took that into account and tried to move the vertices in the correct positions. You need to do a couple more steps and get rid of this, but yeah, every time you 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 modify your reference, you can uh, still use it for uh, for the optimization. Okay. Um, let's see, we we need to actually wrap up things. We're up at the top of the hour, but um, 
see, there's still a few more questions that haven't been answered. One thing, again, that I'd like to recommend is um, we'll, we'll go ahead and email follow-ups to, uh, to these questions. Um, but if you have additional questions, um, if you just visit the Evolute form, and uh, let me just show you where that's at. Um, if you just go to the Evolute Tools web, uh, website, go to Software, uh, Evolute Tools form, and then just discuss here on the form. Um, I'm sure that the Evolute team would love to answer your questions. Um, absolutely, I, absolutely. I know just from experience here at T-Splines, uh, we really value those form discussions. It really helps us improve our product, and, and I'm sure that the Evolute team will feel the same way. So. Yeah, we're really, really interested in knowing all the opinions of, of the people that have used Evolute and to get some feedback from them. And of course, we'll answer any, any questions in the forum or on email. Okay. Um, well, thanks again for, uh, for coming to the webinar. We'll, uh, we'll again follow up with email to those questions that, that, that are still outstanding and, um, and also give, give more information about the T-Splines contest and how you can get uh, a longer, fully featured trial of Evolute tools. So um, thanks again for coming. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for taking the time to watch uh, this webinar.